We are ahead of the game here. Uh, our next speaker is um, Dave Hilds from Aurora. Uh, Dave got his uh, BSc from Queens. I guess you were after I left. Uh, only a year or two. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did a PhD at uh, UBC and has been working for Aurora in Whitehorse, a lovely place to live. You know, you've been up there. Uh, for the last 10 years, been with Aurora as a project geophysicist. And he's going to talk about the uh, an extremely low frequency ELF ground-based tipper survey at the Lawler deposit. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, uh, just before I forget, because I might forget at the end, just I'd like to echo the statements before. This is a great symposium, and I'd like to thank yourself and the other organizers for putting it together. It is, uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot, so thank you. Um, what I'll talk about today is I'll, I'll just spend a uh, wave around this laser pointer for a while. I'll spend a few uh, minutes talking about the system because it's, it's a new system. Most people aren't familiar with it. I'll go through a couple of test cases comparing with, uh, with, with other geophysical techniques and, uh, and then, of course, end with the uh, Lalor deposit. So uh, the ELF, it's a, it's a passive system and it relies on, on natural source fields. We've heard some of this this morning from the, uh, from the ZTEM uh, um, talk. Um, it's, it operates in the, uh, in the extremely low frequency range, which is uh, where it gets its name from for the ELF. And so in this frequency range, almost all of the energy originates from, uh, from lightning discharges. And um, they propagate between the ionosphere and the Earth, which acts as a waveguide, so you can get quite good propagation. Um, however, it, with the high frequencies, they don't propagate that far. And so there is a bit of a time issue about when you do these surveys, particularly for the higher frequencies. And I'll, I'll come back to this later because the, the um, Lalor uh, test survey was done at the end of October and, and it was, uh, the high frequencies were, were quite poor in fact. Um, now, so for a homogeneous Earth, uh, because it acts as a waveguide, the fields are completely horizontal. And when you're in the vicinity of a conductor, you, your magnetic field lines bend around the conductor, and so they tip away from the horizontal. So you get the tipper, and you get this divergence of the tipper right, when, you, when you come to uh, inhomogeneity in the Earth. So that's what it's uh, measuring. It's the ratio between the vertical and horizontal magnetic fields. Um, a few things to note here is, is if you have purely uh, horizontal geology, you get absolutely no tipper response. So there, there is no response for a purely 1D Earth. You need to have lateral contrast to get a tipper response. Um, and the other thing to mention, and I'll, I'll uh, is is a uh, you're only measuring the vertical and horizontal magnetic fields, um, not the electric fields. So I'll pre-answer the question that Leo asked before and that he'll probably ask in a few minutes of how do you get the conductivity without getting the electric fields. And that, that is a bit of a problem. That's one of the other limitations. You can't get absolute conductivities from, from this technique because it only measures the tipper. Um, it is, in general, a, a complex quantity insofar as the, the, the vertical component of the, uh, of the magnetic field is not in phase with the horizontal component. Um, just where does this technique fit in the pantheon of, of EM techniques? Uh, well, it, it's, it's insofar as it's a natural source technique, it's very closely related to MT and AMT, and, and as the same, generally the same frequency range as AMT. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the main difference is, is that you're not measuring the electric field and that you're only measuring the ratio between the vertical and the horizontal field. Um, it, the, in terms of the frequency range that, that we measure, we measure from 11 hertz to 1440 hertz. So it's, a, it's slightly expanded from, from the ZTEM range, but it's in, it's in the audio range. Uh, it, it's, it's very similar to, to AFMAG technique developed in, in, in the 60s. Uh, it's similar in concept to the ELF. It's also very similar to VLF, but at a much lower frequency. Uh, the, the difference with, I mean, the similarity with VLF is that it's a plane wave technique and, the, the, and a passive technique. Uh, however, the, with VLF, it's a polarized source. And, and with, the, with the ELF, uh, 
you're assuming the source isn't polarized. Occasionally, you do see in the data, um, if there's very local thunderstorms around, you do see some polarizing effects. Um, generally, it's fairly obvious, and you just have to wait for other discharges in different directions to, to resolve that problem. Uh, the instrument was developed by uh, Peter Kuzman, and as I say there, it's, uh, it's quite similar to uh, Geotech's ZTEM platform. Uh, in terms of the instrumentation, it's, uh, it's three orthogonal coils, digital compass and a tilt meter. It automatically deconvolves the, 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 the tippers into north and east components. And, you know, the main thing about this technique is that the, although it doesn't, it, it's, it's light, although the beach ball is fairly large, as anyone who's carried it will, uh, will, will attest to, it doesn't, it doesn't fit on your back uh, uh, super well, but it is light, so it's a very portable technique, and so it, it's, it's quick to acquire data. And that, that really is one of the main attractions of this technique, is that it's light, it's portable, and so it's quite a cost-effective uh, technique. Occupation times are generally quite low, uh, less than two minutes. Even in, in the middle of summer, in the afternoon, it can, be, it can be quite a bit less than that. So your production can be quite good in a day, you know, with uh, typically 50 to 100 stations. Again, depending on terrain uh, and, and, uh, and what time of year you're doing it, how long you have to occupy each station for. Um, We'll be talking about two and three D inversions uh, of, of of the data, and so using the uh, the inversion codes of Siri Pinvaraporn and Egbert, both the two D code and the three D code. Um, it's MT code that was uh, modified to deal with tipper only data, so it's suitable suitable for the elf. And as you'd expect, because you don't measure any electric field, you have no sense of of absolute conductivity. So that that is that is a problem with tipper only inversions. And consequently, you, you need to have some idea. Uh, you need to start with a, with a reasonably good um, initial model for these things to work. Um, and layered structures, and, and uh, it, it's better at, at lateral conductivity anomalies than, than layered structures, because that's, that's what the tipper um, is sensitive to. Um, I'll just go through a, a few examples of, of comparing it with, with other more familiar techniques. Uh, this is an example. With compared to DC resistivity survey, um, the the wrong one. This is the uh, the ELF data here. The real and the quadrature uh, run with the 2D model, so that you have your your observed and predicted. Here's your observed and predicted uh, um, uh, DCIP uh, DC resistivity data. Excuse me, um, um, inverted with the UBC code. And so this, uh, it, it, was, it was collected over two, uh, two different years, so the different arrays, uh, which, and, but the array length of this was fairly large. It was one kilometer over here and, and 600 meters here. So it was, it was a fairly uh, good depth of, of penetration for the IP. And we just see some, some examples here. Here's the, the 2D DC recovered model. And here are three uh, uh, cases of, of, of different recovered models from the ELF data. Again, 2D. This is a, these are all cross sections um, of a line running north-south. And, and broadly, the, 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 the two agree with each other. You know, we have, we have this large conductive feature here and uh, that comes up to surface right around there. And, and then, you know, they don't agree everywhere, which is uh, not what you'd expect. They are two different techniques and, and excite the earth in different ways. Um, one difference is a depth. Um, really, the ELF sees a, uh, uh, um, a higher uh, conductivity um, over here, uh, excuse me, a uh, more resistive ground over here, which, which isn't seen in the 2D recovered model. Uh, this is, it, it looks like you're getting to the edge of the depth of resolution around here, and so I think this is an indication that you, that you are seeing quite a bit deeper with the ELF, which is what you'd expect with, with frequencies down to 11 hertz, you know, the skin depths. Uh, are, are, are quite large, depending on what their background conductivity are, up to several kilometers um, with, with the 11 hertz. Um, one big difference, of course, is, is, is in the speed of acquisition. Right? This was a, uh, a three and a half kilometer line that was collected in, in, in less than a day. It was a, it was a very easy day with, with a, with a two-person elf crew. Uh, three and a half line kilometers of IP is, is a, um, 
is a larger un undertaking than two people for, for less than a day. Um, another quick, exam uh, quick comparison with some CSAMT data. Uh, this is the 60-mile property of, uh, of Rackle Metals. Again, we have your, uh, the ELF predicted and observed data here, and then we have cross sections of 2D recovered models, the ELF here, and a 2D recovered model of the CSAMT data here. And there are similarities, uh, broad similarities. We see this, this large conductor here. There are also obvious differences. This conductor is, is modeled as being quite deep in the ELF, while the uh, CSAMT closes it off fairly shallow. I don't have an explanation for this. I mean, again, it's not surprising that the two techniques excite the Earth in different ways. The CSAMT was a, was a scalar survey, so you were looking at one polarization, uh, one, one component of the collection, while, uh, while the ELF is, again, only magnetic fields and is not polarized. So perhaps this, uh, this feature was not coupled well with the exciting field, um, although it, it, it should have been if it was a long strike there, but, but maybe that's what was going on. But again, you know, they, 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 it, it's, it's just showing that it, it gives uh, another data set. It's comparable to other geophysical techniques, not exactly the same as you would expect, but it's, uh, it, it is agreeing enough that, that the technique does, uh, does work. Um, just this is a, 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 an example of a 3D inversion now at, uh, at the Well Green deposit of what was formerly Prophecy Platinum, now is Well Green Platinum. I got uh, the new name right. Um, and this is a section, a cross section of north-south cross section uh, with, with some drill holes. And we're looking at it from the northeast. So we're looking at it at, a, at, a, at an angle. And these drill holes are, uh, are projected. They're off section. So um, it, it's just illustrating that this is a shallow deposit. comes right to surface. Uh, this is, uh, you know, these... These are uh, a good uh, proxies for massive sulfide. Um, I can't remember which is which. One of these is, is the copper assays. And so it does a very good job here of at, at, at defining the, um, this, this deposit at the west zone. And again, these numbers out here actually are encompassed by this anomaly as it comes out the page. Just on this uh, figure, it doesn't look the way it, that way. Um, Getting more something towards more pertinent to to uh, to Lalor. This was a, a test at uh, Halliday Lake in the Athabasca Basin, where there's uh, to to look to see um, to test its uh, ability to to recover deep conductors. This is a um, these are two cross section views. This is a cross section looking south, cross section looking west, and this is a plan view. And this is the unconformity here at around 800 meters. So this, uh, this, the, the survey was done here, and, and, and uh, this is, these are recovered 3D models from the ELF uh, data. So it, 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 it certainly did uh, 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 detect uh, a deep conductor uh, below 800 meters. It puts the, 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 um, the, the conductor f like uh, quite a bit below the unconformity, which is, which is a little bit of a, um, a mystery still. Um, but it, it, it certainly was there, and this, this, uh, there, there was a uh, moving loop time domain survey done along this line, which is why it's kind of uh, out. And a number, it might be hard to see, there's a number of holes drilled there. Um, the, the, uh, the, the cause of this, of this conductor is still unknown. Uh, it hasn't been intersected yet. They did a downhole survey on, on, uh, on those holes, but, um, or at least one of the holes that I know of, but it was, uh, it was blocked, the hole was blocked at the unconformity. So all I know is the conductor was yet deeper. But, um, but so this, uh, it, it just shows that, the, that certainly the ELF can detect uh, uh, conductors deeper than 800 meters certainly in, in underneath the unconformity. Um, this is just one more example from the Halliday Lake Athabasca. I've just drawn in the approximate unconformity at 800 meters. These are cross sections, uh, north-south cross sections. So just at three different eastings, and at each one you can see this very well-defined um, large conductor, which was the geophysical target uh, that we were seeing if we could detect. However, what's interesting is you also see this, this very distinct structure in the sandstone that's, that's recovered. So it's, uh, uh, that was 
uh, a nice bonus that even though that wasn't the, the, the primary geophysical target to see the structures in the sandstone, uh, which can be used as alteration halos as, and as vectors, um, was very encouraging. So now, getting on to the Laylor deposit, which is what we're all here to talk about. Um, a small orientation survey was, was done in 2010 uh, by Peter Kuzman, who again was the uh, uh, developer of, of the instrument, Andrew Duman, and, uh, and actually Matt Holden from Hud Bay, who was in the audience, was, uh, was out collecting the data. Um, and so collected uh, three lines, line 176, line 184, and then across line here of uh, line 2000. And so this is just showing some of the data. Uh, uh, again, I've taken the, the, the divergence of the tipper, which as I showed in one of those early slides, it's, it's a reasonable proxy for, for conductivity that you can get directly from the data. Um, at, at 22 hertz and 180 hertz. And so there, there is an, an obvious uh, um, uh, conductor happening around the, uh, the, the Lalor body. Now, as I mentioned before, and I'll, I'll kind of say again here, w uh, there's a few things to consider about this data set. And the first thing is that it was collected in late October, and the high frequencies were, were, were very were, were poor. So uh, I didn't, uh, in subsequent slides, I didn't, I didn't use 720 and 1440 because the, the, there was not much signal. Um, and secondly, this was collected uh, with the prototype of, of the instrument. Most of the data I've shown previously was collected with a, with a, with a newer version with larger coils and uh, the signal to noise is, is quite a lot better. Um, so that's, but that's the data set that we had. So that's what we dealt with. In particular, the, uh, the, the quadrature was, was, um, was quite noisy for this data. Um, and so I started with some, some 2D inversion results. This is line 176. 184 and 2000, just to remind you, that's 176, that's 184, that's line 2000. Uh, I, I only used the real data, or I just assigned very high errors to the quadrature because they were, they were quite bad. Um, and, uh, and, and it, it recovers a, a conductors, and so these are cross sections uh, along the line of um, for the 2D inversions. And so the, it, it does uh, um, recover um, uh, conductivity uh, uh, anomalies approximately where the Lalor deposit is. And I, I should have put them on here, but I, but I didn't. However, they are a little shallow. And there is this thing that goes down to depth that I'm, I'm not sure about that. But and there, it's consistent between the, uh, between the two lines. And this line, uh, although the fit is not very good, it's, uh, it's quite a short line. Um, nevertheless, it, uh, I used it as an, as an approximation uh, of, of the width of the anomaly. Because what I did with these 2D models is I stitched together uh, a 3D model, just stacking the 2D models together uh, based on the width of, of here to, to give a, an initial model for the 3D model. Um, so, some examples of some 3D inversions. So, uh, what we have here are, are two views um, looking here from, from the azimuth 237. And so, these are obviously the, the lenses of the um, Lalor deposit. Um, now, now, the other thing with, with tipper only inversions is, is the, the, the depth can be difficult to nail down. And so what I did is I, I started, I mean, I, I ran a lot of inversions, but uh, these are three here that, that I, I lowered the, the 2D results down 300 meters, uh, 200 meters and 300 meters to start the initial model off with conductivities at different depths. So y you see the vertical spread here. Th these are the initial models and these are the recovered models. So what's interesting, and, and what you should note, is that, is that it, it's, it's, it's condensed the, uh, the, the vertical axis. All, all of the models tend to converge towards this, this one response, uh, somewhat uh, irregardless of, of, of where you start with. Again, it's, it's not completely independent of the initial model. It, it was hard to make this one work well with a, um, uh, with a half space. 
you know, partially, again, that's, it's because of the quality of the data. And it was a small data set to begin with. And then I, I initially started by decimating in half by throwing out all the quadrature and then throwing out the high frequency. So there, there wasn't as much data left to, to work with. Um, and so certainly as, as compared to some of the other data sets from Halliday Lake and, and, and some of the other ones where starting with the half space produced uh, uh, something a little more geologically reasonable, this, this one had trouble unless you started uh, a little closer to what the conductivity structure was. Um, uh, now, this is just some, some predicted and observed data. Uh, uh, so again, th this, is, this is the same um, slide, the same data that I showed before, just slightly blown up. So this is the 22 hertz and the 180 hertz, the tipper divergence. And this is the predicted data for these two, um, these two um, uh, frequencies. And so the, the, the fit isn't great, certainly. You know, it it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's broadly fits the, um, the observed data, but it, it's, it's not fantastic. And, and I, I had to assign fairly large errors to, uh, to, to get it to go. Um, this is uh, two views of, of uh, one of the recovered models. This one's looking east, and this one's looking from the north. Um, so these are the same models, and, and uh, I, I've put the, um, the, the, the conductive blues are the most conductive, and pinks are the most resi resistive. And so that's if you spill ketchup on your map, you won't drill it thinking it's a conductor. So it's for Dave. Um, <laughs> Uh, so now this is uh, again this. There's a few results that come out of this that are um, that are that are fairly robust and consistent with with all of the um, inversions that, that that were run. And th one of the main things is is that it, it always uh, it, it, the the conductive feature is always above the lenses, so it, it doesn't hit where the lenses are. It definitely detects. The, 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 you know, there is a conductive anomaly at the Lallard deposit, and it is dipping in, in the right direction. I mean, it follows the dip quite clearly of, of the Lallard deposit, uh, dipping off to the, uh, to the northeast there. Um, however, but it doesn't put it at the right depths. It's always a little more shallow. And, and also, you have this, um, um, this the, the most conductive piece comes right here, just to the... Uh, just to the southwest of the deposit. And you know, what does this mean geologically? Well, I mean, uh, above the Lailer deposit are the resistive hanging wall uh, rocks where, that are unmineralized. So it, it doesn't really make sense geologically. Um, but that, that is where it, uh, it kept wanting to put the conductivity. So it, it, it certainly didn't nail the uh, Lailer deposit. But it did show where it was and, and had a reasonable dip. So we'll just, in, in, in conclusion, uh, you know, I think the, the ELF is, is a very good reconnaissance technique, and, and particularly for, for deep, uh, steeply dipping conductors. It, uh, it, it's, it's quite cheap to do, and it does have a very good depth investigation. Um, it, and by, by itself, it's more suitable as an anomaly finder than an ore detector. You know, in, in very special uh, circumstances, in simple geologies, perhaps in the Athabasca Basin where there's not a lot going on, it, 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 you, you might be able to use it for more than that. But I, I don't see this as being uh, uh, and or from time domain techniques. You know, seeing some of the previous talks, uh, in, a large loop time domain survey will nail the geometry of, of, of your conductor better than a tipper only technique. But where it can shine is a reconnaissance technique because it is fast and it's cheap to do and possibly be followed up with other geophysical techniques um, for your drill. And, and so it has the ability to get the dip and structure of an ore body uh, through structure or mapping geology, and, but not the details of the geometry as, as we see from the Layler deposit. So I think it's a uh, cost-effective option. Your exploration quiver. It's not the only option, and it shouldn't be the only option, but, it's, uh, but it, it, it could be one of the techniques that uh, you can use. Thank you, and uh, thank you also to all the companies that allowed me to present their data.
questions? Doug Goldenberg, back to the ground. Well, yeah, I mean, it's true in, in, in the 11 hertz is, uh, uh, can be noisy um, if, if you don't want to spend the time at, uh, to, at each station. If, obviously, if you, if you spend an infinite amount of time, well, I shouldn't say an infinite amount of time. Here's an example uh, where we just, we just tried it for grins uh, in Nunavut in the middle of winter, and uh, this <laughs> didn't matter how long you waited. The system noise was bigger than the signal, so it was, it was a waste of time. Um, but but the, the 11 hertz, if, if you're in the middle of summer, you get decent 11 hertz uh, data within a few minutes. And so that's, uh, yeah, but if in, in, in when conditions aren't so good, uh, the, 11, the 11 and the 22, particularly the 11, are, are, um, are quite a bit noisier. Oh, Sergio. Stand up, Sergio. Oh. Shove to the back of the room. Yeah, well, that's uh, we haven't tried that yet. <laughs> here's some here's some pops and some snapples. You know, all those all those spherics that the uh, radio hams get excited about. <laughs> I have a question following up on your your main theme here. That's a good reconnaissance tool. I, I was interested in that comparison between the CSAMT and the ELF survey. What would you say is the ratio of cost between those two surveys? Well. Uh, I, the ratio of costs, uh, I guess, you know, I mean, that one line took half a day for an ELF survey crew of two and took a crew of five a full day. So one-fifth, and not, not including the time to lay out the loop, to lay out the transmitter. Right. So um, assuming all other costs are equal and, and your contractors are charging the same amount for personnel and equipment, let's say around a fifth or maybe a little less because of uh, lower camp costs and, and not laying out the loop. <laughs> 